I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 9. Begin reading verse 8. It says in your bulletins, I'll be reading to 8, verses 8 to 15, but I'm actually going to read up to verse 17. So far, what we've seen in this narrative of Noah, we've seen him delivered from the flood, we've seen him being brought out of the ark with his family, and now in chapter 9, he's out of the ark and the Lord enters into a covenant with Noah. So we'll begin reading chapter 9, verse 8. This is God's holy and inspired word. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as come out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it, and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. May God speak to us through his word. May the name of Christ ever be praised. Amen. So my four-year-old son, Moses, he looks in amazement whenever he discovers a rainbow in the sky. And I remember his excitement one particular time when he found a rainbow and he pointed it out to me and I, I quickly took a glance and then went back to what I was doing. And it struck me. The difference in amazement and appreciation for God's creation between me and a four-year-old child. Mark Twain wrote, We have not the reverent feeling for the rainbow that a savage had because we know how it is made. And he says, We have lost as much as we have gained by prying into that matter. You know, today, I think that we not only have trouble observing the beauty and the wonder of of our creation, but the beauty and the wonder of the covenant and the beauty and the wonder of the Lord of the covenant. So by God's grace, what I want to do today is I want to look at the nature of this covenant made with Noah and with all of creation, which is commonly called the Noahic covenant. Uh, And what I want to do is I want to examine three points from this passage. I want to examine the strength of this covenant. I want to examine the compassion of this covenant. And lastly, look at the sign of this covenant. So first, the strength of this covenant. Now, Pastor Tim has already talked in length in a previous sermon about the definition of a covenant. And I'll just briefly recap to say that a a covenant is an agreement between two parties based on a promise. It's essentially a legal binding contract, usually with stipulations for both parties, such as a marriage. Now, there are several covenants in redemptive history throughout the Bible. And today, in Christian circles in America, there's all this talk about what does it mean to be reformed? Well, we're part of a reformed church. What does it mean to be reformed? Some have suggested that Being reformed means believing in God's sovereignty, 
Others suggest, no, no, it's about believing in God's sovereignty as it relates to salvation. However, a major tenet of Reformed theology is how we view the covenant, okay? Now, we are what's called covenantalist in a Reformed and Presbyterian church. It's a little different than what's called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism looks at the scriptures and sees these different covenants, and they they see them as distinct um, covenants with discontinuity. God's working different ways and very different ways throughout each covenant. But as covenantalists, we look at the Bible and we see the unity of the covenants. So we see God working in the Bible through different administrations of what's called his covenant of grace. To look at this a different way, I've talked before about when God created Adam and Eve, he entered into a covenant of works with them. Now it required their perfect obedience. They broke that covenant by their disobedience when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God then made a new covenant with them. And we, with, we call this covenant with man the covenant of grace. Now, there are various administrations of this covenant of grace. The first one is in Genesis 3.15. So in the middle of the Lord cursing Adam and Eve for breaking the covenant of works, he also makes a promise that a Messiah will come from the seed of the woman to deliver us from our rebellion by crushing the serpent's head. We call this administration of the covenant of grace the Adamic covenant, the covenant with Adam. Next is the Noahic covenant. And later, God entered into a covenant with Abraham called the Abrahamic covenant. And much later at Mount Sinai, God enters with Israel into the Mosaic covenant. Now, if you remember, that covenant has the stipulations of Israel's obedience to the Mosaic law. After this, and I think it's 2 Samuel 7, God makes a covenant with David called the Davidic covenant. Now, all of these covenants find their climax and their fulfillment in the new covenant, which is the final administration of the covenant of grace, in which Jesus ratifies this new covenant with his blood. So, he's the seed promised in the Adamic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant. He's the king from the line of David who will rule on the throne of the kingdom of God forever in the Davidic covenant. See, this is Reformed theology. This is biblical theology. This is the process that God reveals himself and works redemptively in history. And all of these covenants are under the umbrella of the covenant of grace. And this is the the work the Lord is doing to ensure that he fulfills his plan of redemption to redeem his people. It's dependent on the Lord. And we know that, just in this passage, there are different tenses used for the verb establish in this passage. Um, It demonstrates God's initiative and strength in the covenant. At verse 9, the verb is in the imminent future. I now establish. Verse 11, it's in the present tense. I establish. Verse 17, it's in the present perfect. I have established. Grammatically, this leaves no question who's in control, who's sovereign, who has the power to make the covenant and the strength to see it through. You see, unlike marriage or other covenants, the Noahic covenant doesn't require any assent from or stipulations for mankind. God's declaration It's actually emphatic in the Hebrew in verse 9. It should read something like, Now I, behold, I am establishing my covenant. The obligation of this covenant rests on the Lord alone. The Lord says three times in this passage, verse 8, 11, 15, that it's, quote, my covenant. So while covenants usually involve stipulations for both parties, the Noahic covenant has stipulations only for one. God himself. See, God pledges to all of creation that he'll show unparalleled mercy. It's unconditional. No matter what evil humans may unleash in this world, there'll never be another worldwide destruction by a flood. This covenant of unconditional mercy is for the whole earth. 
he pledges this, and he will see it through by his own strength. My family, we were just at the beach down at Wildwood Crest, and my son Moses, he's beginning to get over his fear of the water. He, uh, he just turned four, so he cannot yet swim, but he loves doing something that he calls jumping the waves. And this involves going out far enough to where the water begins to become deep. And then he wants you to, to hold him, to put your hands under his arms from behind. And as a wave comes, he wants you to throw him up in the air over the wave. Now you can imagine this feels great on my already surgically repaired spine, but the, uh, but the kid loves it. But without the strength of his parents or his grandparents pulling him up over the waves, a four-year-old boy would drown. He's out in the deep of the waters with the turbulence of the waves. He wouldn't stand a chance. He knows that he can depend on the strength of his father. And we can depend on the strength of our father. You see, when God commits the covenant with us, we know that by the arm of the Lord, by, by his strength, he will see it through. Time after time again, God has shown himself faithful and strong, creating the world by the mere power of his word. Parting the Red Sea, deliverance through his judges, deliverance through his appointed kings, miraculous works through his prophets, a virgin birth, an empty tomb. What more could the Lord show us that would convince us of his strength? and faithfulness to his promise. As the hymn says, what more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.13 So the focus of this passage is on the Lord. The Lord who establishes the covenant. He is strong he is almighty. He sees promises through. And he cares about us, which leads us to our next point, the compassion of the covenant. The Noahic covenant displays God's care for his creation, for all people, believing and unbelieving, even for the animals. His compassion is revealed in this care for all things. God created this world and everything in it. And we know that when he created the material world, he affirmed creation's goodness in Genesis 1 with that repeated phrase, it is good, it is good. And this is where the people called ascetics went too far. You see, throughout history, and there are even some modern-day examples, ascetics lived a lifestyle characterized by having few possessions in an attempt to focus on their spirituality and to not be distracted by the things of this world. Now, there's, there's much wisdom in this, but most often what you see is ascetics who have too low of a view of the material world, of the creation which God has made and said it is good, which the Son reaffirmed by coming to the material world and taking on flesh, the world which God promised to show mercy to, including the very animals of the earth. You see, God loves the material world, his creation, and he is merciful towards it. But also, verse 9 says that God establishes his covenant with Noah and his offspring after him. Theologian John Calvin and Puritans like Francis Roberts, they realize that here we, we begin to see the principle of God acting graciously towards certain individuals and their children. The Lord not only makes promises to us to be received by faith, but to our covenant children. And you see, this is why, as Presbyterians, this is a Reformed church, and, and one of the tenets of, another tenet of Reformed theology is the way the Bible views our children. This is another example of the compassion of the covenant. God cares for the littlest of things. He cares for his people and their children. In the Abrahamic covenant, the sign given for the covenant is circumcision. And it's given to believers and their children. God tells Abraham in Genesis 
17.7, that I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Then the Lord enters the Mosaic covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. And he gives them the covenant signs of the Sabbath and circumcision again. A sign given to their children. In Exodus 4, there's kind of this weird narrative at the end of the chapter. He's called Moses to his work. But then the Lord is preparing to put Moses to death because he neglected to place his son in the covenant by placing the covenant mark on him. And Moses' wife, Zipporah, she actually saves her husband's life by circumcising their child. You see, we are commanded to give our children the covenant sign. Today, it's baptism. That, may be, that they may be part of the covenant. Now, it's up to them to show covenant obedience by professing faith, or they will be covenant breakers if they are faithless. This is why the Westminster Confession of Faith, the doctrine of this church, it actually calls neglecting or withholding baptism, the covenant sign from our children, the, quote, great sin. The sign of the new covenant, baptism, it belongs to our children. Jesus himself said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. You see, the compassion of the covenant Lord is shown by his care for believers, for his people, and their children. And here in the Noahic covenant, for the well-being of the entire creation. If you remember, it was humanity's sin that brought judgment on the world in the first place. Grieving our compassionate Lord. The magician's nephew by C.S. Lewis is about a boy, Diggory. He enters the world of Narnia. Now, much like us all, Diggory has these mixed motivations. On one hand, it's for his friend Polly's sake that he even embarks on this adventure to Narnia. She needs his help. But on the other, it's because of his mother's illness and his own grief that he will do anything for anyone to make her better. Aslan in, these, uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia, he's this lion who is king of Narnia. He's a symbolic godlike or Christ-like figure in these books. And in The Magician's Nephew, at one point, Aslan, he, he draws Diggory into this conversation. And Diggory begins to imagine that he can make a deal with Aslan, that, that I'll do this for him if he does something for me. And Lewis is making a point. We cannot manipulate God or indebt him to us. But then Lewis makes another significant point. As Diggory is sure he cannot make a deal, he, he becomes sure as he, he, he gets to, he um, he's, gets closer to this great lion and he just becomes sure in his presence that, that no deal can be struck. And then Lewis writes that in that moment, Diggory was, quote, sure that the lion cared more about my mother than I did myself. And you see, the grief and the tears of God are complex. Of course, they're tears of compassion. Jesus wept with his friends at the death of their brother. But his grief and tears are also mixed anger and grief at the unnaturalness of sin and death as Jesus groaned severely in his spirit at the death of Lazarus. In the beginning of our journey examining Noah's history, Pastor Tim mentioned how sin it grieved the Lord. And it was this massive amount of sin and injustice that, that led to the flood of judgment. Pastor Tim read in Genesis 6 how the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intention of, his, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, as it is for all of us. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. It grieves the Lord to see the wickedness of this world, the wickedness of our hearts, our wars, our fighting, hurting each other, our, our gossiping, our bitterness, our rebelling against his will, assaulting his holiness. It grieves the Lord because he cares about his creation. It's also out of the same care for us 
that he will show unparalleled mercy, to, to restrain his judgment on a worldwide level in spite of the human sinfulness. Second Peter 3, the Apostle Peter writes that God's mercy shown to us in this Noahic covenant is so that none should perish, but all should reach repentance. He will not lose any of his elect, but he will give them all time to reach repentance. The mercy shown in this covenant, it displays the the compassion of this covenantal Lord, his care for us, which he symbolizes in the sign of the covenant, our third point. Now, with most covenants, the Lord provides a sign. So it's similar to when we make a covenant to enter into marriage. We have wedding bands. It's a sign of our marriage covenant. And the sign given for the Noahic covenant is a rainbow. A sign is something that points to something beyond itself. Therefore, it has a meaning. And like circumcision was and baptism is a sign of the covenant of grace. And, you know, it doesn't mean that a child who was circumcised or a child who is baptized actually professes faith. It's it's not a sign of our faith. It's a sign of what faith points to. Grafting into Christ. Regeneration. Forgiveness of sins. It's like a Sign that tells you there's a, a bend in the road ahead. Now, the sign itself isn't the bend in the road. It's pointing to an objective truth. Baptism is a sign of salvation. It tells of an objective truth. It tells of the gospel, of the covenant of grace. So the question becomes, what does the sign for the Noahic covenant, the rainbow, what does it mean? Well, there is no rainbow unless there's a storm. Imagine this. Any time the storm clouds appeared, Noah and his family would be reminded of the the horrors of the flood, of the judgment for the injustices on the earth. So to comfort mankind whenever the storm clouds and the waters appeared, rather than a a horrifying reminder of judgment, the bow that emerges now is a reminder of God's mercy of his compassion. There is no rainbow unless there's a storm. And every storm will pass. It's a promise from God. But also, I find it fascinating that the Lord uses a rainbow out of all things to symbolize his mercy and peace. The word translated for rainbow here, it actually omits the sense of of rain. The Hebrew word is keshet, which simply means a bow. And this is the word for a weapon, a battle or hunting bow. God is saying, I've, I've laid up my war bow. No more condemnation. There's mercy. Now, a common motif in the ancient Near Eastern pagan imagery is that of a bow-wielding deity. So you see, in the ancient Near East mythologies, the, the star constellations that, that looked like bows was thought of to be the anger of their gods. But Old Testament scholar Bruce Waltke notes that in Genesis 9, the warrior's bow is hung up. And it's pointed away from the earth. God's anger and wrath are pointed away from mankind. An instrument of war has now become a symbol of peace through God's covenant with Noah. A rainbow connecting the earth and the heavens. Now where else in the Bible do we see an instrument of death become an instrument of life? How about right behind me? The cross. You know, it used to be quite curious for for century folks to see the symbol of a cross become a symbol of life. It's as if today a symbol of a major religion would become the electric chair. You see, crucifixions were once regarded as, as the cruelest execution. Victims were scourged, beaten, forced to carry the large wooden beam to the location of execution. They were secured by being tied or nailed to the large wooden beam, left to hang for several days until they would die. Now, the nails were driven through the wrist because the bones in the hand could not support the weight of the victim. And death came about through the loss of blood circulation, which would follow by a coronary collapse, which would take several days 
Now, if they wanted to hurry along the death, they could break the victim's legs below the knees with a club, which would then eliminate their ability to to push themselves up, to breathe and take in air. But ordinarily, these executions were intentionally slow and painful. Actually, the term excruciating literally means out of crucifying. Yet Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. The symbol of curses now becomes the symbol of blessings. The cross is our hope. It's the price of our redemption from our sins, our transgression of the covenant of works. It's the payment that secures and accomplishes the covenant of grace. And Jesus is the fulfillment of even the three points in our sermon. You see, by Jesus' weakness on the cross, he shows us the strength of God to fulfill the covenant obligations. By Jesus' death on the cross in our stead, he shows us the compassion of of God to fulfill his covenant for our sake. And by what Jesus accomplished on the cross, he gives us the sign of baptism as a sign and seal of the accomplishment of the cross. The new covenant is the final administration of the covenant of grace, fulfilling all it promised. Jesus is the greater Noah. And while the, rim, while, the rain, while the rainbow is the reminder of God's mercy, the cross is God's mercy. Another symbol of death has once again become a symbol of life. As Peter writes, Christ himself bore our sins in his body on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. The rainbow The sign of the Noahic covenant, it it symbolizes God's wrath pointed away from mankind. Let me ask you a question. When you look at a rainbow, which direction is it pointed if the bow were to shoot an arrow? It's pointed back up at the heavens. And the cross is the fulfillment of that sign. You see, on the cross, Jesus did take the wrath of justice against sin that we deserve. You see, he took that arrow and he took it straight in the heart. His sacrifice is sufficient once for all to give us the forgiveness of our sins. Christ is the fulfillment of the rainbow connecting heaven and earth, like Jacob's ladder, connecting us to the heavens so that we may have a relationship with God. And while covenants have stipulations or obligations, the Noahic covenant is unconditional. But the covenant of grace... The gospel, it has one obligation. Faith. Faith. You must have faith in Jesus Christ and his atoning work on the cross. As Paul says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourself or anything you have done, but the gift of God. Of course, John 3.16, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even though we have rebelled against you in the covenant of works, that we have transgressed your holy law, we have assaulted your holiness, we've rebelled against your will, that you have seen fit to show us mercy, that you even show all of creation mercy that you're giving time for your people to repent and place their faith in you. And we would ask that you'd continue to press the gospel upon us through your word and spirit, that we would carry this message of good news to the world, and that also for us, that this would take hold of our hearts, that we would be captivated by your mercy, that it would move us to appreciate the wonders of Christ and the glory of him held up on high. We ask this in Christ's holy name. Amen.